Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today, 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 24. And Absalom, uh, you remember how he came to power. He uh, set himself up in the gate of the city, the place of judgment. And when people would come from a distance, and he'd say, you there, where, where are you from? And the guy would say, well, I'm from the tribe of Reuben. He said, well, and what are you here for? Well, someone stole uh, five head of my cattle, and I'm here to see a judge to see if I can get justice. Well, there's no one here. David's kind of fallen down on the job and appointing judges. Uh, but it's too bad I'm not the judge and I'm not the king because you're right and I would rule in your favor. Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel with his lies and deception. Much as the Antichrist will steal the hearts of the world with his lies and deception. I'll tell you, today, look around, you, you see uh, political leaders telling people what they think they, sh they want to hear, not what they need to hear. Religious leaders telling the people what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. And Absalom, uh, a, a very much a type for the Antichrist. And David uh, led his group, uh, not knowing who he could trust, out of Jerusalem. And they were going to wait uh, on the west side of Jordan and they set up a network to communicate what Absalom's camp was doing. In our last lecture we saw uh, Ahithophel, Absalom went into Jerusalem and he consulted Ahithophel. And Ahithophel said the first thing you need to do is to go into David's ten concubines that he left. Uh, that would definitely establish you as the king. It also would make it impossible for David and Absalom to reconcile their difference. That would be out of the question after uh, Absalom did that. Uh, Ahithophel further counseled Absalom that you let me, uh, Ahithophel speaking, take 12,000 troops and run David down quickly before he has a chance to get organized and all of his supporters come to him. And I'll find David and kill him alone. Then the hearts of the, the people will be back toward you. I'll bring them back to Jerusalem and everything will be hunky-dory. Well, Hushai, uh, they consulted his counsel and he said, you know, the uh, counsel of Ahithophel is not good at this time. David's smarter than that. He's going to hide. He's not going to sleep among the people. Uh, you won't find David. Uh, Ahithophel won't be able to find David. And he suggested that Absalom gather all the armies of Israel, not just 12,000, and then Absalom lead the troops against David. Uh, they accepted the uh, counsel of uh, Hushai, Ahithophel went home, put his house in order, and uh, killed himself. He hanged himself. Meanwhile, uh, word, the network of communications got word to David that Absalom is coming with all the armies of Israel flee across the Jordan. And that's where we left off in our last lecture. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it up, 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 24, and it reads, Then David came to Mahanaim. Mahanaim means two gates, or, or two choices you could translate. And Absalom passed over Jordan, he and all the men of Israel with him. David uh, barely made it across the Jordan, Mahanaim being a fortified city, a walled city. 
And so we have some protection. And by this time, Hushai's counsel uh, caused a bit of delay. It would have taken the armies of Israel days to prepare and to gather. Uh, so David has had time to uh, make plans and also for those people who were loyal to him to come to him. It's still going to be uh, the men of David are going to be far outnumbered, but that's something that David's men are quite used to. From the days that they were running from the armies of Saul, uh, David's men, <coughs> excuse me, uh, quite accustomed to being outnumbered. There's civil war on the horizon. Verse 25. And Absalom made Amasa uh, captain of the host instead of Joab. Why? Because Joab was with David, of course. Which Amasa was a man's son whose name was Ithra, an Israelite, that went in to Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister to Zerubbabel, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, Zariah, Joab's mother. Now, this verse needs a lot of help. Uh, Ithra, and make a note of 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 17, is called Jether in, in uh, 1 Chronicles. And it states there that he's an Ishmaelite. Now, saying that Ithra was an Israelite would be as senseless as saying David was an Israelite. The only time that you say someone was of another nation was with they were a sojourner there. So I think the fact that Ithra was more likely a Gentile, an Ishmaelite. Now, the, that she was Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, who was sister to Zariah. Now, Zariah was David's sister. And I hope you know who David's father is because that's the only way that you're going to know the key of David uh, out of the root of Jesse. So Zariah was, and David, the, the, their father was both, uh, uh, the father of both of them was Jesse. Uh, but what we've got here is Abigail and Zariah were actually half-sisters having the same mother but not the same father. Nahash was the father of Abigail. I hope I didn't confuse you with that, but uh, it's, it's a little confusing to be, to be said properly. Verse 26, So Israel and Absalom pitched in the land of Gilead, this being on the east side of Jordan, uh, making ready for war. And it came to pass when David was come to Mahanaim that Shobi, the son of Nahash of Rabah, this is a different Nahash now, don't be confused, the son of uh, Nahash of Rabah of the children of Ammon. And Macher, Macher was the one who helped uh, Mephibosheth back in chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. The son of Amiel of Lodabar and Barzillai, the Gileadite of Rogelam. Now, this Shobi, uh, was probably the brother of Hanun, Hanun, the son of Nahash, who when Nahash died, you remember David sent uh, counselors or comforters with gifts to Hanun, and Hanun, at the advice of his counselors, uh, cut the beards of David's servants halfway off and uh, cut their uh, their dress, their skirts, halfway up uh, hard by the buttocks is what it says in the King James. It means they cut it up where their buns were showing on their rear ends. And uh, that was for that reason that David uh, destroyed the capital of Ammon, Reba. But uh, evidently David uh, had showed favor uh, to Shobi in some way, but what we have here is a group of very wealthy people who are going to provide supplies to David, much needed supplies. Verse 28, these people brought beds and basins or cups and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn and beans and lentils and parched pulse. All of these things would be much needed by David 
and his troops. You see, and it's not just David and his troops. Most of them have their families with them, their wives and their children, a lot of mouths to feed. Uh, David could not establish a supply line back to Jerusalem. Absalom could. And so David had no source for supplies, but these people came to his rescue. Uh, no doubt these people very loyal to David and were providing materials at risk to their own lives. If Absalom found out, verse 29, and honey and butter and sheep and cheese of kine, kine, another word for cattle, cows in other words, for David and for the people that were with him to eat. For they said, the people is hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. They need supplies after their long journey through the northern part of the desert of Judah and then crossing over the Jordan onto the east side. Chapter 18, verse 1, the civil war between David and Absalom. <clears throat> Chapter 18, verse 1, And David numbered the people that were with him, and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. David was very astute to uh, well-tested military strategy. Uh, David would be about, according to uh, Bollinger in the Companion Bible, would be about 56 years old at this time. And it's certainly not David's first rodeo uh, when it comes to war. Verse 2, And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab, under the command of Joab his nephew, and a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zariah, also David's nephew, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Atai, the Gittite. And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. David was a warrior uh, from the time that he took on the uh, champion of Gath when he was 16 or 17 years old. He proved himself in, in, in battle and was quite a warrior. Now, Atai, the Gittite, that means he was of Gath, which, and this was a Philistine. And you may recall when David was first coming out of Jerusalem that Atai and his little ones, his children, his family, uh, came in and were following David. And David told Itai, you know, there's really no sense in you getting involved in this. You could just remain in, in Jerusalem and serve whoever the king is. I, I don't know where I'm going. Uh, I don't know where this is all going to end. And Itai said, you know, if you, if you live, I'll live with you. If you die, I'll die with you. Uh, that's quite a statement from Atai and David rewarding uh, Atai with his confidence in leading one third of the troops that David had at his disposal. But David's saying, I'm going with you. <clears throat> Verse 3, But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth, for if we flee away, they will not care for us. They, they won't care if we run as long as you are still alive. Neither if half of us die will they care for us. It won't matter if David is still alive. But now thou art worth 10,000 of us. Therefore now it is better that thou succor us out of the city. And many scholars wrestle with the latter part of this verse. To succor means to help and some people, scholars, believe that they wanted him to stay in Mahanaim and to pray for them. Uh, some thought that, uh, the scholars think that this means that he was going to keep some of the troops with him in case Itai, uh, Joab, or Abishai were put to the worse, and then they could serve as reinforcements to uh, their others. Verse 4, And the king said unto them, 
what seemeth you best I will do, okay? I'll remain in Mahanaim and try and help you from there. And the king stood by the gate side, and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands, the military troops uh, going off to war, rallying to David's cause and, and defending his right to the throne. Uh, I can just see David standing beside the gate, wishing that he also was going to fight, but uh, not. Verse 5, And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Atai, the three commanders of all his troops, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. Now, this was a mistake on David's part. He's literally tying the hands of his military. And we're going to see that, that uh, this becomes a problem uh, in that David is saying Absalom's the enemy. You don't take it easy on the enemy. If you're going to war, you give it all you've got. You don't take on rules of engagement that endanger the lives of your people and spare the lives of the enemy. And that's exactly what David did. He, he put shackles on the hands of his military, deal gently with Absalom, the enemy. Remember, Absalom is a type for the Antichrist as well. And I'll tell you this, beloved, you better be prepared to do anything but deal gently with the Antichrist. He doesn't play games. He never takes a vacation. Uh, it's a serious spiritual war. Uh, don't take on rules of engagement that help the enemy and harm your cause, in, in our case, God's cause. Verse 6. So the people, these are David's army, went out into the field against Israel, against Absalom's gathered army. And the battle was in the wood of Ephraim. This Psalm 55, make a note of it. Uh, it's called uh, Dove in the Distant Woods, or Oaks is actually the way it's stated in the subscription. Uh, this is going to be the same noise that David heard above the mulberry trees back in chapter 5 when he was warring with the Philistines. He inquired of Abiathar the priest through the Urim and Thummim, and God said, yes, go up against the Philistines. I'll deliver you, and God did. Uh, a short period of time later, the Philistines regrouped. David asked, do I go up against them again through the Urim and Thummim, Thummim of Abiathar? God said, no, don't go up. You wait until you hear the noise, the sound in, in the mulberry, above the mulberry trees. And then you encompass or circle around and attack from then. It's the same armies that Elisha prayed that his armor bearer would be able to see in 2 Kings chapter 6, that, uh, the horses of fire that were around Mount Dotham. Verse 7, where the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David, uh, Absalom's armies put to the worse. And there was there a great slaughter that day of 20,000 men. How did this happen? God is in control. For the battle was there scattered over the face of all the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Some scholars say that this was a very uh, swampy, jungle-like uh, area, and that the armies of Absalom were swallowed up in quicksand, uh, that's not what happened at all. You know what happened. It was the same thing that the, that the uh, dove and the distant oaks in Psalm 55. Uh, back in chapter 5, we had the sound above the mulberry trees. It was the armies of God taking care of business. 
God had anointed David king of Israel, not Absalom. Verse 9, And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs or branches of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. He suspended himself uh, in midair, basically. Remember back in chapter 14, verse 26, where we saw that description of Absalom, that he was a good-looking rascal. But what was it about his hair? Well, he cut or pulled his hair but once a year. And when he cut it, it was almost four pounds of hair. I guess he should have got a haircut before he went to this battle because uh, right now he's in a difficult situation. Verse 10, And a certain man saw it, one of David's men saw it, and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. Absalom's probably wishing about this time that he had followed the counsel of Ahithophel and allowed Ahithophel to take 12,000 troops and go after David while he remained in Jerusalem. Can you imagine how helpless Absalom felt uh, hanging by his hair, hair in midair? Verse 11, And Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him, and why didst not thou smite him there to the ground? Why didn't you kill him? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. It was a common for a commander to give presents to his military people who killed uh, key members of the enemy. And, and whose fault is this that this did, the man did not kill Absalom? It's David's fault. David made a very stupid decision in commanding the troops to take it easy on Absalom, to go lightly on the enemy. Verse 12, And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, if you had given me a hundred more shekels than what you said, a hundredfold more shekels, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king charged thee and Abishai and Atai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. He put the troops of David in a very difficult situation. Be gentle on the enemy. It's ridiculous that David shackled his men this way. Verse 13. Otherwise, I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life. The man continues, Had I killed the king's son, the king would have heard about it, and then my life would be in jeopardy, is what this means. For there is no matter hid from the king. There are no secrets from King David. And thou thyself wouldest have set thyself against me. If David had commanded you to come over and put me down, you would have been right there following uh, David's instruction. Verse 14, Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. Uh, in other words, enough. Le le this is enough. Leave this alone. I don't have time for this. And he, this being uh, Joab, took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom, while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. Now these darts, uh, subject of uh, confusion, there is a weapon known as a dart, but it did not come in existence until after the time of the captivity, uh, the captivity to the Babylonians. This is hundreds of years before that. Um, I think that what Joab did, he took uh, his rod and, and ran uh, Absalom through three times with it. 
uh, he didn't. Joab was a warrior. Joab knew how to kill, uh, and he didn't kill, as we'll see in the next verse, verse 15. And ten young men that bear Joab's armor, his weapons, compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. They finished Absalom off. Uh, so much for David's instructions to be gentle uh, on Absalom. Verse 16, And Joab blew the trumpet, and the people returned from pursuing after Israel, after Absalom's army. For Joab held back the people. He blew the trumpet, the sound to stop fighting, to cease, uh, that enough is enough. You know, God does not like civil war where you have bone of bone, flesh of flesh, killing each other. And Joab, I think, was probably sickened uh, by this as well. And he, he's saying, okay, that's enough. The rebellion is over. Uh, the false king Absalom is dead. Verse 17. And they took Absalom and cast him into a great pit in the wood, a type for the abyss that Satan will go into, and laid a very great heap of stones upon him. And all Israel fled, every one, to his tent. The armies that uh, had gathered to follow Absalom when they saw that their leader had fallen and was dead, uh, they went back, crossed the Jordan, and went home. The king's son was dead. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar which is in the king's dale. This is on a valley on the east side of Jordan. Most of you know it is uh, Kidron Valley where the brook Kidron runs through. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. Now this is at variance with chapter 14, verse 27, where it states that Absalom had three sons and a daughter that he named Tamar. The sons are not named there. I think it's because they all died at a very young age, and that's the reason it says here that he had no sons to keep his name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his name, Absalom's pillar. And it is called unto this day Absalom's place. Now this is not uh, quite the end that Absalom had imagined for himself. He reared up this pillar as to be a fantastic memorial, and what he ended up with was a pile of rocks to be his monument. Verse 19, Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, Let me now run and bear the king tidings how that the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. Let me run and give King David the good news. You remember Ahimaaz and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. Uh, here ah Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, the high priest. They were the members of that network that were set to let David know what was going on in Absalom's camp. Verse 20. And Joab said unto him, Thou shalt not bear tidings this day, but thou shalt bear tidings another day. But this day thou shalt bear no tidings, because the king's son is dead. Tidings are good news. Joab is telling Ahamaez that you don't have good news, or at least David is not going to consider it good news. Why? because the king's son is dead. Not a good reaction for the leader of an opposing army. When the enemy is killed, you should be victorious. You should be joy and celebrating. Your own men would be celebrating and joyful that you had found and gotten the victory over the enemy. But here, the people are reacting quite contrary to what you would normally expect. They're, they're fearful that David, uh, what David's going to do when he finds out that Absalom is dead. 
Then said Joab to Cushai, Go tell the king what thou hast seen. And Cushai bowed down himself unto Joab, bowed himself unto Joab, and ran. Joab sent one of his servants to tell David the bad news rather than uh, the son of Zadok having to do so. Verse 22, Then said Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, yet again to Joab, but howsoever, or, or be what may, we could translate, let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushai. And Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, my son, seeing thou hast no tidings ready? You don't have any good news for David. Ahimaaz is insistent on going. But howsoever, or be what may, said he, let me run. And he said unto him, Run, go. Then Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and overran Cushi. He passed Cushi on the way to David. Uh, obviously, he was fleet of foot. He was a fast runner. Meanwhile, back at Mahanaim, uh, the people are anxiously awaiting word uh, anxiously awaiting news as to what went on at the front, 24. And David sat between the two gates, this being uh, the name of the city, Mahanaim, which means, if you translate it, two gates. Uh, this probably was a courtyard between the outer gate and the inner gate of the city. And the watchman went up to the roof over the gate unto the wall, and lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man running alone. It's Ahimaaz, the high priest, Zadok's son. And the watchman cried and told the king. And the king said, If he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. There's good news in his mouth if he's alone. And he came apace and drew near. In other words, if there's one man running, it's good tidings. Why? Because they probably were victorious. If you look out after your troops have been to war and you see a bunch of folks running back toward the fortified city of Mahanaim, that means your troops uh, don't have good news that they have been put to the worst by the enemy and they're running for their lives. Well, how will all this turn out? Don't miss the next lecture. We got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself, when were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, you feel free to call that number and leave your question. Uh, please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. We try and teach God's Word in a positive format, throwing out negative about others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing, fully capable of all three. 
If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 telephone number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in if you prefer. Got a prayer request? Well, we don't need a telephone number. You don't need a mailing address. Talk to your Heavenly Father. Make time each day to go to Him in prayer. You know, I don't think you have a lot of competition these days. It seems like everyone is so busy uh, running here, running there, uh, working two jobs to keep up the mortgage payments and to pay for the kids' college, and they don't have time for God. You know, that hurts his feelings when, when his children don't have time for him. And, you know, the only time he hears from them is when they need something, when they got trouble in their lives. Oh, God, you got to help me. And that's, uh, that's not the way he likes to do it. He likes to help his children, but he likes to help those that have time for him. Uh, that's where the blessings come from. We do have these prayer requests. Father, we come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, illness and families, Father. Uh, marital problems, financial difficulties, you know, Father. If it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. Uh, we also lift up our military troops and our uh, police officers who protect us in these dangerous times. Watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions, see what's on the mind of folks. First up, we have Bob in California. And thank you for your kind comments. Uh, question, Revelation 19, 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, whose blood was on the vesture. Well, he's returning on a white war horse. He's not returning as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes at the second advent. And what do you have a war horse for? To make war against the enemy. And you follow whose blood was on the vesture, the blood of the enemy. Uh, you can bet that Jesus Christ won't establish a rules of engagement that say, take it easy on the enemy, as we saw King David do uh, with Absalom. You follow also in Revelation, it says there was a half hour of silence in heaven. Please explain. Well, Revelation chapter 8 verse 1 states that there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Uh, what's the hour that it's talking about being half of? The hour of temptation. And that is a five-month period we learn in Revelation chapter 9. Uh, the season of the locust, May through September, is five months. If there's silence for half an hour, that's two and a half months. Why is there silence in heaven? Because Antichrist is here on earth. Pat from Georgia. If the Antichrist is supposed to be here for five months, but he only comes the last two and a half months, we've got a lot of questions on this, what is taking place the first two and a half months? What should we look for so we'll know uh, the start of the five months? Well, that's the one world political system, the first beast of Revelation chapter 13. And what happens? Well, that political system receives a deadly wound. And don't ask me to document that, but as things progress, I think that that's going to be a financial deadly wound. And then that's when pretty boy Floyd, Antichrist, shows up on the scene, uh, heals the deadly wound of the one world political system. The whole world sees him, thinks he's Jesus, and they worship him. Shane in Georgia. In the Bible, it says they brought Jesus myrrh. Uh, what is myrrh? Well, according uh, to the Smith's Bible Dictionary, in the Old Testament, myrrh was probably a plant called ladanum, a highly fragrant resin and a, a volatile oil used as a cosmetic. It comes from the cystus known in Europe as the rock rose and a shrub that grows in Palestine and around uh, the Mediterranean Sea. In the New Testament, uh, myrrh is 
uh, known as balsamodendron mura, and that's, I guess, the uh, biological name, uh, comes from a small tree whose wood and bark emit a strong odor. Jim from Alabama, what was the eastern boundary of Israel? Well, that depends on what period of time you're talking about. You see, as wars happen, boundaries were subject to move depending on who won the war. Um, most of the time of Israel, when we think of the, the, the promised land that God gave to the children of Israel, uh, the eastern boundary was formed by the, the nations of Ammon, uh, Moab, and then to the southeast you had Edom. And during the time of David and Solomon, the Ammonites, Moabites, and Edomites were defeated, which gave Israel, Solomon in particular, a clear shot at the Gulf of Aqaba, from which uh, he launched the uh, ships of Tarshish that went uh, seafaring to the land of Ophir where they brought back uh, gold and whatnot. Uh, okay, I'll leave it at that. Gene in California. How s I have studied with the chapel over 10 years and have learned so much. You make our Father's word come alive. Well, his word is alive. Uh, Arnold, Pastor Arnold Murray used to always say that the word is pregnant, that it continues to evolve. I'm 80 years old and look forward to the word each day. Well, we're glad you enjoy the program, uh, Gene. Uh, thank you and your staff. Once we die and go to the Father in paradise, in paradise, do our work stop? No, I, I, I know God does not like lazy people and everyone is going to have work uh, to accomplish. Um, explain the word transfiguration. Well, that is explained in Matthew uh, chapter 17 when Jesus uh, went up to the Mount of Transfiguration with three of his disciples. And who appeared there with Jesus in transfigured bodies? Uh, Moses and Elijah. So a transfigured body, uh, but beware too that uh, Satan uh, can transfigure himself uh, into an angel of light, the teachings of Paul. And his angels can transfigure themselves into angels of light. So uh, be weary. Tammy in Washington. What does God's word say about women who can't have children? Well. Uh, spiritually speaking, nothing but good is said about women who can't have children. Uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 29, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. And what does all that mean? Well, a lot of churches have a hard time deciphering that particular verse. What it's talking about is Blessed are those who aren't spiritually in bed with the Antichrist when Christ returns. What would it mean if Jesus returned after 2,000 years expecting a virgin bride and what he found was a woman who was giving uh, suck uh, through her paps? She's been with somebody else is what it means. And spiritually, again, she's been in bed with the Antichrist. Wasn't fit to be the virgin bride of Christ. <clears throat> Robin in Minnesota. My sister committed suicide. My pastor said she won't go to heaven. Can you share any scripture that may address suicide I believe she was troubled and wasn't in her right mind. I would ask your pastor uh, who appointed him to be the judge of who goes to heaven and who does not. Uh, there's only one judge, even God. And Father knows the hearts and minds of men and women. And he knows when someone is troubled, as you stated, and when someone is not 
in their right mind. There are circumstances. Uh, this we, man has done a pretty good job of polluting this old earth, and we we bring sickness upon ourselves by not following the health laws of God, not eating right. Uh, we cause pollution, which uh, can cause cancers uh, among our people. But uh, uh, again, uh, I'd ask your pastor, who made you the judge? Uh, pastors don't decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Uh, God Almighty does. John in Vermont, please explain the difference between a King James 1611 and the King James 16, uh, King James Version Bible we have today. Well, the 1611 is the original uh, translation from the manuscripts into English. It was commissioned by King James of England, uh, therefore the name of the Bible, the King James Version Bible. Now, the 1611 was written in Old English, uh, and if you've ever seen a copy of it, you know that it's difficult for a modern-day English uh, speaker or reader uh, to understand. Uh, most folks today have an authorized version of the King James Version Bible. That means it's been revised into a bit more modern-day English, although some people have difficulty because of the these and thous, etc. It's important to have a King James Version Bible. Why? Because you can use a strong concordance to take any word in the Bible uh, back to the original uh, manuscripts and determine if it was a proper translation. Uh, example, uh, in the book of Luke chapter 14, I believe it's verse 27, uh, Jesus says you have to hate your mother and father to follow me. Now, wait a minute. Jesus saying you have to hate, that's what it says. Check it out in your King James Version Bible. It's a bad translation, and that's why you need to know how to use a Strong's Concordance. If you take that word hate and look it up, you'll find that it also means to love less, which is how that uh, is translated in another uh, gospel, another book of the gospels, that you have to love your, fa your mother and father less than me if you're going to follow me. But Moses taught us that you honor your mother and father, not hate your mother and father. So when something comes up that like that and you know something's wrong, you can take your strong concordance and look it up and find out how it should have been translated. <clears throat> Mark in New York, please explain the difference in the end days between God's laws and man's law. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, we are to do our best to obey God's law and we're also to do our best to obey civil law. Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, the teachings of Jesus. He said, you know, whose inscription is on that coin? And they said, well, it's Caesar's. And he said, well, then render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, which means pay your taxes, obey civil law. Brody in Louisiana. <clears throat> Is it possible since Eve tried to give Adam the fruit and he didn't take it that both Cain and Abel were Satan's sons? That Abel made good choice to please God and Cain didn't and followed Satan. Is that possible? No, that's not possible and that's not what happened. I don't know how you can read chapter 3 of Genesis and come up with the idea that Adam refused to take of the fruit that Eve offered him. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, uh, it states there that um, uh, Eve gave the fruit to her husband and he did eat. Uh, Cain and Abel were twins. Uh, Eve had already uh, had intercourse with the serpent and she conceived. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, God said, I will greatly multiply thy conception then Adam knew his wife. She had a son named uh, Abel, which was Adam's son, but they were twins by different fathers. 
Who do we have here? James in South Carolina. Where in the Bible is it that it says blood shall be up to a horse's bridle? And who will do this? And who are they? I've been looking and listening to Shepherd's Chapel teaching on cable here for some years now, and I love the teaching. Uh, I listening to you, oh, and you give the time that you listen, okay. And you're thinking, uh, James, of Revelation chapter 14, verse 20. And what's going on there is Jesus has returned. And you have to know that everyone is in spiritual bodies at that time. But the blood up to the horse's bridles uh, is the cup of God's wrath that will be poured out on the enemies of God. Uh, and those that are deserving will drink it to the full measure. Kathleen in Michigan. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall last forever. Please give scripture on this, and does this mean that the third heaven age shall pass someday also? No, it won't ever pass away. The scripture you're referring to is Mark uh, chapter 13, verse 31. But the first earth and heaven age passed away. The second earth and heaven age will pass away. But the third earth and heaven age will never pass away. Why? Because that is the eternity, well, never ending, the kingdom of God. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 21 and Revelation 22. Jean from Georgia, my pastor is a policeman in order to take care of his family and pay bills. He says that God called him to pastor. My problem is that he wears a gun in church even while he's preaching. I love the way he prays the Lord Back in Jesus' day, you say that they had swords to protect themselves. My question is, is it all right for him to have such a career and be a pastor of a church also? Would love to hear an answer from you. I think uh, many police officers would make good pastors. Uh, they're, they're disciplined uh, people for the most part. Uh, they know the law, uh, civil law, very well. Um, you know, and I'll bet the victims of that church shooting down in South Carolina where nine innocent Christians were gunned down by some idiot. I'll bet they wish one of them would have had a, a, a weapon so that they could have protected themselves. Cowards choose soft targets. Uh, cowards like to go into a church where they think no one will be carrying a firearm and go shooting up the place. Well, I can I'll give you a warning. Don't come to Shepherd's Chapel uh, expecting that it's a soft target. Daryl in Arizona. When Michael and his angels fight and kick out Satan and his angels out of heaven, are Satan and his angels coming back in spiritual bodies or vehicles like in Ezekiel chapter 1? Uh, they will definitely be in spiritual bodies. They will not be in flesh. Uh, now the fallen angels refused to be born of woman the first go around. They're certainly not going to agree to be born of woman the second go around. Now, will they be in bodies capable of transporting themselves by flying, or will they be in vehicles uh, such as Ezekiel described in Ezekiel chapter 1? Uh, both are possibilities. But we do know Michael and his angels throw them out in, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, and the following verses. June in Missouri. Could you please tell me what it means when it says the flesh will fall from the body before the bones hit the ground? I always thought it was a nuke, but you say no nuclear weapons will come to pass. 
I can't remember where I read this in the Bible. I try to watch every day. I love the way you teach the truth of the Word of God. We're glad you enjoy the teaching. And June, what you're thinking about is Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, in their sockets. In other words, now what this is describing is what happens to the flesh body when the seventh trump sounds. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 and the following verses. In the twinkling of an eye, uh, the flesh takes on a spiritual body. When Jesus returns, there is no more human flesh. Mary, and I don't know where Mary's from, uh, on kings, did Jesus go back when he had arisen to talk with the kings uh, about salvation, or will they be an, will there be another chance in the millennium? Well, Jesus didn't just go back to the kings; he went back to all who had passed away before his crucifixion. You see, it wouldn't have been fair for God to judge those who lived under the law uh, with those who uh, were lived under the dispensation of grace. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, Jesus went back and preached the good news, the gospel to the prisoners. I'm out of time. I want you to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. And it makes your Father's day when He looks down from heaven and He sees you reading the letter that He wrote to you. It makes his day, and when you make his day, he will make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, beloved, and it's this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even when there's trouble in your life. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.